can someone tell me an example type of internet application? I'll give you one to get started. Web browsing. Think of web browsing as an internet application. All right. Web browsing involves you using a web browser as a client software to access a web server. There are different types of web browsers, Firefox, Safari, Opera, IE and others. And there are different software implementations of web servers, Apache web server, Microsoft IIS and others, which you may not be aware of. But they are software applications that we use to do this general application of web browsing. We'll call that an internet application. Can you give me some other examples? Types, general types of internet applications. Google Chrome is a web browser. All right? That falls under web browsing, something different than web browsing. Again? Mobile applications, what do you mean? Give me a, a type of, what, what does it do, this mobile application? Online games, okay, so online games, how do games work, online games? Like multiplayer games, what do you do in terms of the software? So you have, with online games, many games, you have the game client installed on your computer and you often need to contact a game server. All right, so there'll be a server, the game server, and many of the players, they all have their own installation of the game client, and the client contacts the server and they communicate. Say with a multiplayer game, what you send to the server, you send this to the server your current position. This is your XY coordinates sends to the server and the server sends your position to all the other players so that the other players know where you are as you move and it can update the scene or the, the, uh, the display to see where other players are moving in real time. So it needs to be quite fast how that happens. So online games and there are different variations are as a type of internet application. Others? Come on, I'm sure you've used many internet applications. BitTorrent. So BitTorrent is an application that, or even a protocol to support what? File download. Okay, you can download files by downloading via different servers, different parts of the file. Others? Instant messaging. Okay, uh, in the old days, MSN, instant messenger, line and similar uh, uh, instant messaging clients where you type in a message, you press send, and it's sent instantly, hopefully, to the other person's computer, maybe via a server. Another type of application, email is another type of application. Not instant messaging, sometimes there's a delay. What else? iTunes, in what way is that? Music, playing music, streaming music, for example. Streaming audio. The server has the audio, the, the music, and when you press play, it sends you in real time that audio and plays back on your computer. Same with video streaming. It may be web-based or it may be stand another application you install on your device that streams to you. Voice, Skype and similar, you talk and your friend hears and vice versa. Databases, so they may be consumer applications that we use, but there are many business-oriented applications where, uh, for example, you access a database or there's an application for a company for managing the accounts or the, the finance and so on. There are many types of internet applications. We We use a lot of them, but there are others that sometimes we're not so familiar with. The common thing about most of those applications we mentioned is that they follow what we call a client-server model. In web browsing, your browser is the client, the web server is the server. Online gaming, you, the software installed on your computer is the client, there's a game server as well. Even when we make voice calls, we can think that one person acts as a client and calls the server, the other person. The other person's software is the server. 
So a client-server model is commonly used for how to initiate communications in the internet. Let's say there are two, two users, two applications, the client and the server. The basic approach that it works is that the server, the server software is running on a computer, usually always running. A web server is a piece of software always running on a particular computer, 24 hours a day it runs there. And it sits and waits. It waits for a client to initiate communications. So it's the client that says, I want to contact the server. Sends a message to the server saying, let's communicate. And once that communication is initiated, for example, the client sends a message to the server, the server sends one back saying, yes, let's communicate, let's exchange some data then the data can often flow in both directions. Client can send data to the server, server can send back to the client. The key thing is that it's the client that initiates communications. And that will have some impact on how addressing is used and how we identify different applications. Some of the ones we mentioned are listed there, those internet applications. There are a number of issues of how to uh, support client server applications in the internet. Many of our applications we need reliability. That is, if I download a one megabyte file from a server, I want to make sure that the one megabyte that one my client gets is identical to what the server had. If the server sends me one megabyte but I only get 900 kilobytes, that's not reliable communications. In the, the exam in the next week or so, there may be a, a multiple, quest, multiple choice question or even a short answer question. How do I provide reliability? What mechanism provides reliability? What will your answer be? Reliable communications, what's the mechanism we will use? Uh, describe it. How do we get reliability? We studied it just after the midterm. Uh, yeah, it's easier. How do we make sure that if data is lost, then we can actually get it delivered? Retransmit. We retransmit. Generally, we call that ARQ, automatic repeat request, but retransmission. Okay. We saw stop and wait. We send a packet. We get an act back. If we don't get an act, we send it again, an extension. So retransmission is important. Many applications need this. So rather than the application programmer having to implement that in their application, it's offloaded to a separate protocol, a transport protocol. TCP in particular does reliability. The idea, the application doesn't have to worry about reliability, implementing ARQ, uh, stop and wait, or go back in, or select and reject. Instead, TCP implements that for our application, and your application that you create simply sends the data using TCP. So that's one thing that we do. We use transport protocols to support some of the common features that many applications need. When you go and program your own application to communicate across a network, you would like to program it on any operating system using any language such that your client can talk to a server running on a different operating system and a different programming language. So having a common programming interface is useful there. And there is one, it's called the Sockets ABI. It allows us to write applications that simply, or a very uh, simple interface for sending data between applications. Common across different languages and different OSs. We will not talk about that. You may see that in other courses, how to program with Sockets. And the last thing which we'll cover 
a little bit today is how do I identify applications? So we'll talk about that and we'll see the answer is port numbers. So to finish this course, well, we'll say a little bit about transport protocols and especially about port numbers. What are the two main transport protocols you used in your assignment? You remember you did tests with IPERF, you probably used TCP and UDP. They are the two main transport protocols. There are a few others, but they are the, uh, the most common. And in fact, TCP is the most common of those two as well. Transport protocols support uh, sending data between applications, software on each computer. TCP is the most widely used. It involves setting up a connection before we send data. It has error control in that it supports retransmissions. Send the data. If you don't get an ACK, send it again. Flow control, stop and wait, or a sliding window flow control mechanism it, it uses. And another algorithm for congestion control so that the source will not overflow the routers. The result is it's very complex. And we're not trying to study how those algorithms work, although we know some basics of error and flow control. Another one which is very simple is UDP, which omits all those features and just sends the data. Very simple, but maybe not so useful for some applications that need reliability. We'll see it in an example, but each transport protocol is given a number. There's a standard number, and it's called the protocol number. 6 is for used for TCP, 17 UDP, 1 for ICMP. You can look at the website to see many, many more. We may see some examples as we go. So let's look at an example of how we communicate between applications. And that will lead us to some addresses that we need. We'll use this example. A very simple, maybe old example for communicating between a source, application, and a destination. We have the source host will wanting to be sent data to the destination host and in fact a specific application on the source host to an application on the destination host. And for this example, let's say it's my web browser on the source wants to send to the web server on the destination. What does my source host need to know to get data to the destination host? How am I going to get data to the destination host? There are many hosts in the internet. How is my source host going to get to that particular destination host in the internet? The address. So we need to know the IP address of the destination host. So let's give them some IP addresses for this example. So to, I, to get data to a particular device on the internet, we think an IP address identifies that device. So let's say that my source host, I'll say, is 1.1.1.1 and the destination 2222. Simple IP addresses for this example. And let's say my source host knows that IP address. Somehow I've, I've learnt it in the past. I know that I want to send to 2.2.2.2. And the protocol we use to send is IP, the internet protocol. We create our datagram and we set the source and destination address. So let's draw our datagram our IP datagram that we would send across the internet.
So the IP datagram would have a header, an IP header, and inside that will be the data of that datagram. We'll see the details of the data shortly. And some fields in the datagram header, there'll be a source address. I would set, when I create this datagram, the source address to be my IP address. And the destination address. And there will be other fields in the header, but those two currently, which we'll need. And what I would do is I'd send that IP datagram via the routers in the internet, and they would use their routing tables to deliver to our destination host. And it will be received by the IP software in my destination host. What is inside my da IP datagram? What's the payload of this? datagram. Well, well, look at where it came from. We're going to use web browsing as an example. With web browsing, and we'll, we'll simplify the task, let's say we've created some data and the protocol we use is HTTP for web browsing. And web browsing requires reliability. When we deliver the request and get a web page in response, we must make sure it's 100% accurate, so we use TCP as the transport protocol because that provides the reliability we need to transfer the request and get the web page. So, in fact, our IP datagram, what IP gets is a TCP segment. So inside the IP datagram is a TCP header, which we haven't looked at yet, and inside the TCP segment is the HTTP message. And if you know a little bit about HTTP, it's quite simple. We send a request to the web server. The web server sends a reply. So I'll say it's the HTTP request. What happens is my browser, when I say click on a link, eventually it creates a request and that request is sent using TCP. TCP will handle retransmissions if necessary. Let's say it's set up a connection, there's no retransmissions necessary. It, TCP attaches a header and we'll see some examples of the, the content in a moment and then sends using IP across the internet. So the IP datagram is destined to 2.2.2.2 and it's going to be arrive at the IP software. It'll get to the destination and it should be delivered to the web server. That's our aim here. We can think the flow of the data in this case. The user does something, it generates data and it goes from the web browser through to the TCP software, through IP, sent via our LAN, for example, sent across the internet. And it arrives at the IP software. Why did it arrive there? Because the destination address matches the address for this interface, this computer. What does the IP software do when it receives this datagram? Has it reached the destination? Did this datagram get to the destination? Yes, I am 2.2.2.2. So what does the IP software do now? It removes the header. That is, all right, we've got the datagram. We'll remove the header. In fact, we'll look at the contents, examine the contents of the header, and eventually remove it and send what's inside up. Up where? That is, we're going to 
we get this datagram, we have a thousand bytes inside, we're going to send those one thousand bytes to one of three transport protocols. Which one? TCP, how do you know that? How does computer 2.2.2, .2 how many twos, four twos know that? Sorry? It, something must be included in the datagram, in particular one of the headers, to say when you get this data, the, what's inside must go to TCP. We can't just guess. It's not known what the source sent, because they're on the other side of the world. So it's in fact inside the IP header. There's a, another field that says the content of this datagram should go to TCP. Which field? It's called the protocol number. If we jump back to our IP datagram, this is our IP datagram. There was a source IP address, 32-bit destination IP address, and a 16-bit protocol number. Sorry, 8-bit protocol number. This field indicates the number of the transport protocol that this data belongs to. So there's another field here that we use. In the IP header, we have multiple fields. Another one of interest is the protocol field. And this is set when we send the datagram, when we create it, we set it to a value that means TCP. What value means TCP? If you look on your slides, TCP is number six. If you just check the slides, they're, they're allocated numbers. TCP is number six, so we set it to six. TCP is six, UDP is 17, ICMP is 1. Other pro transport protocols have other numbers, but they are the common ones we will see in this or in other courses. So when I create the datagram at my computer, I set, ah, I use TCP, so the destination is also must use TCP, they must use the same transport protocol. So I set the protocol number in the IP header to 6. Then, when IP receives it at the destination, it sees, ah, I am the destination, and in particular, the content must go to protocol number six, TCP. So we send the content up to TCP. So the protocol number is another address. It's the address of the transport protocol used. What happens next? TCP does some processing. We're not going to study how it processes the data. You'll see that in a next semester. Where does TCP send the content of the data? So it removes or it will look in the header and then send the content somewhere. In this case, there are two applications running, some instant messaging client and the web server. Which one does it send to? How do you know it goes to the web server? Okay, we know, we can see that the source sent it, but how does this computer that received it know send to the web server? Well, we need another type of address. We will need another type of address that identifies the applications on the computer. And the type of address is called a port number or simply a port. Applications are allocated port numbers. Some are fixed or, or static, some may change over time. So let's talk about port numbers. Port numbers are a different type of address. An IP address identifies an interface of a computer on the internet. 
A protocol number identifies a transport protocol. A port number identifies an application. They are 16-bit numbers and they are associated with the transport protocol. TCP uses them, so does UDP. And there's a source and a destination port number in the transport protocol header. They are local to a particular computer. So with 16 bits, the values can range from 0 up to about 65,000. And those port numbers are managed by my computer, my operating system. But of those 65,000 possible values, there are three different ranges. There's what's called well-known ports. Up to 1,023 have been used for a long time, since the start of uh, the transport protocols. And they're used for very, very well-known or old uh, server-based applications, usually. And some, I think, you may have seen before. Web browsing or web servers use HTTP, and the corresponding port number is 80. If you use HTTPS for a secure web connection, the server uses a different port number, 443. If you secure shell log into another computer, the server will use port 22. And some others here. There, and there are many, okay, or up to 1,000. Some are quite common that you may see over time. These are port numbers that the server uses. Not the client, but the server. Your web browser doesn't use port 80. The web server you contact uses port 80. But there are many types of servers. The well-known ones are the, the old ones and widely used, but you create your own online game and you set up your own server. You can set your own port number and you can register a port number. So up to about 49,000 are port numbers which are called registered ports used for maybe not as common applications, but usually mainly for server applications. Your MySQL database server can listen on port 3306. Steam gaming servers, maybe 27015 and so on. So different servers will be registering different port numbers. So they are for servers and then clients, your web browser, your game client, your instant messaging client, usually will be allocated a port number in this range of 49,000 up to 65,000. Allocated by your operating system. And it's up to your operating system to uniquely uh, allocate port numbers. And they may change, so we call them a dynamic ports. Today your web browser uses one number, tomorrow a different number. To finish our example here, and to finish our lecture today, let's allocate some port numbers to our applications. What port number should my web server use? Well, web servers typically use port 80. Instant messaging server, I can never remember uh, messaging clients, but I'll make one up. Don't copy this one down. 936, for example. Well. It may not be a uh, well-known port. It could have been a higher one, in fact. But different than port 80, important point. My web browser would have a port number assigned by the operating system. And uh, again, it's in that higher range. Let's say I'll just, again, make one up, 50123. And maybe my instant messaging client, in this case, uh, 53,687. Just some random large numbers here within the range. So when my computer creates the IP datagram and the TCP segment, inside the TCP header are two port numbers, source and destination port. The TCP header has two fields of importance, the source port, the application that sent it, in my case was 50123, and the destination port. And because it, 
the application that created it was my web browser, the default destination port will be that of a web server, port 80. This is in the TCP header, these two fields. When TCP receives this segment, it checks the destination port. Destination port 80, therefore TCP knows which application to send to. Don't send to the instant messaging client, send to the web server. So the port number tells it send to this application, which receives, it processes, and the, the data is being delivered to the destination. Most protocols are bi-directional, so the server sends back a response. Where does it send the response to? Well, we use the source addresses to identify where to respond to. The source port, 50123, will be the destination port in the response. The source IP, 1.1.1.1, will be the destination IP in the response. The protocol number is the same, it's six at both endpoints. So we can now send a response back to the web browser application. So what we've introduced here and is important for uh, internet communications is two new types of addresses. So in total, we have five addresses that ide identify our communications in the internet. We have the source IP address, the destination IP address, where we can think IP addresses identify hosts on the internet or interfaces of hosts. <coughs> we have a protocol number which identifies the transport protocol that both hosts are using. Number six for TCP, 17 for UDP. And we have port numbers which identify the applications which are communicating. Source port, usually for the client application for the uh, first message and the destination port, say the server application, port 80 for web browsing, web servers, for example. So what we'll do tomorrow to finish is we'll recap and we'll see back in our example of our network and our routing tables of how we send a packet and what are the fields in the packet header. And we'll summarize on what we know about uh, the transport protocols and that will complete the course. Details of the transport protocols and application protocols you will see in a course on networking next semester. <coughs>